Thank you all for joining us today to hear how the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC are working toward a vaccine for COVID-19. Dr. Louis Falo, Professor and Chair of Dermatology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and UPMC, will first describe the novel way this vaccine is being delivered. Dr. Andrea Gamboto, Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, will explain how the vaccine works. And finally, Dr. Don Yealy, our Chair of Emergency Medicine, will give a brief update on the COVID-19 testing and patient care at UPMC hospitals. First, we're going to play a short video so you can see what makes this new vaccine so remarkable. Members of the media, there is a link to a high quality version of this video in your press release that we distributed earlier, and everyone can find it on our website at upmc.com media. So for this vaccine, we're going to deliver the antigen with a novel technology that's uh, referred to as a dissolvable microneedle array. What the microneedle array is able to do is to deliver the vaccine antigen directly into those areas of the skin that are made to make an immune response. And so it results in a very potent vaccine. When you're thinking about how these microneedle arrays are actually used in practice, think about them as almost like a band-aid. And so the microneedle array is simply applied to the skin topically, pressed into place very shortly, and then taken off and thrown away. And then the antigen is already delivered. And the biggest challenge is then scale up uh, the production to, to the number that the, this vaccine is gonna be eventually needed. We have a technology that is a pretty common technology, it's not rocket science, it's a subunit vaccine which is uh, uh, relatively uh, easy to manufacture and uh, is scalable. We think that the, if immunogenic uh, with the combination of the delivery system uh, can make possible candidate uh, for a pandemic vaccine. So I think it's important to remember that this vaccine and other vaccines that are going to be emerging are really the result of a lot of work that's been done by scientists in very diverse areas and we need to bring all those scientists together from different areas working together to be successful in this effort. And that's what's happening here. After our experts give a few brief remarks, we will take your questions. Dr. Fela. Thank you. As mentioned in the video, this vaccine is the result of a collaboration involving scientists from very diverse fields, vaccinologists, skin biologists, bioengineers and virologists, all coming together to work towards a common goal. That's the type of collaborative environment we have here at Pitt and at UPMC. This is also the same place where Dr. Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine nearly 65 years ago, dropping the number of disabling or deadly cases from more than 55,000 per year to essentially none today. For vaccine delivery, our lab developed this microneedle array approach it is a Band-Aid-like patch that has hundreds of microscopic needles uh, made up of a sugar-like substance that rapidly dissolves in the body. The vaccine is integrated into the needles. When pressed onto the skin, the needles penetrate the outer skin layer and then dissolve and release the vaccine. The skin is our first line of defense against viruses, bacteria, and other harmful invaders. Because of that, it has evolved to be very efficient at mounting immune responses, which means less vaccine is needed compared to a traditional shot. Our process for making this vaccine does not require any overly complex or expensive equipment, so it is very scalable. At the present time in our lab, one person with a set of molds and a centrifuge can make hundreds of microneedle arrays in a single day. Another important feature is that unlike most current vaccines, this vaccine doesn't need to be kept frozen or refrigerated. It is shelf stable at room temperature like Band-Aid. That reduces shipping costs and supports vaccine distribution, particularly to less developed countries. Our next steps include beginning a clinical trial. We are currently in contact with the FDA. This process normally takes months to years, but these pandemic conditions are not normal. The NIH, the FDA, and other regulatory agencies have made terrific progress in accelerating this process. Once we get approval from the FDA, we will be ready to start human safety trials. We are speaking with the FDA now and hope to move this process along as quickly as possible. 
Thank you. Andrea Gamboso will now tell us uh, a little bit more about how this vaccine was developed and how it works. Thank you. So my lab work on vaccine for SARS coronavirus one during the 2003 epidemic, and then MERS coronavirus a decade later. So when the genetic sequence for SARS coronavirus two was published uh, late in January this year, we were able to plug into our existing tool and rapidly produce uh, a vaccine. So we use a genetically engineered cell to make a piece of the spike protein on the outside of SARS coronavirus 2. This is the part of the virus that the immune system sees. And when that happened, it triggered antibody production, which should protect against viral infection and COVID-19 disease. This is how uh, annual flu shot work. The spike protein peas are dissolved in the sugar solution and then spun into micro needle that uh, uh, Dr. Fellow just described. We test our micro needle vaccine in mice and found that after two weeks they develop antibody to the SARS coronavirus 2. Our vaccine is based on the directly deliver of simple protein antigen, which is like many of the successful vaccines that are now in use. It does not rely on the body to make the protein like some of the more experimental vaccine uh, under development. And because we are not using the old virus, uh, our approach is uh, also relatively safe. Now, Dr. Ely will give an update uh, on COVID-19 in our region and our hospital. Dr. Ely. Thank you very much, Dr. Fellow and Dr. Gamboto. Uh, thank you for sharing this groundbreaking achievement. People expect excellence in care and excellence in new care capability from a world-class academic medical center, and that's what we are delivering. As a physician and as an investigator, I appreciate the rigor and quickness that got your vaccine discovery through a peer review process, and that process allows for the best insights to become true. This is the first coronavirus vaccine candidate in this pandemic to achieve this important milestone. Many of our local and regional media outlets are interested in an update in our current case counts and the UPMC experience in both testing and in care, and I'll report on those. Across the UPMC system, we've performed over 4,100 tests and 386 have been positive. That's a positivity rate of about 9%. Over the past 10 days, in addition to previous sample collection sites and testing facilities that existed. UPMC has set up specimen collection centers in Harrisburg, in Williamsport, Erie, Altoona, Somerset, and in Jamestown, New York. In Harrisburg, we've collected 228 samples from two different sites. In Williamsport, we've collected 171 samples. In Erie, 243 samples. In Altoona, 147. And in Somerset, which opened just two days ago, we've collected 25 samples. In Jamestown, where UPMC Chautauqua is located, we opened yesterday and we collected 20 samples on the first day. Many specimens for people who were mildly symptomatic and were being sent home to self-quarantine with those symptoms are sent on to commercial labs, while the remaining samples are tested at UPMC's central laboratory. We do not have complete results back on all the tests that have been sent off, but we have many back. Right now, we're seeing positivity rates that range as low as 3% in an area, but the consistent rate is between 8 and 12%. We'll know more about the positivity rate in each individual region as we gain more and more experience over the coming days and weeks. We currently have 67 inpatients that are positive for COVID-19 across the entire UPMC system. Most do not need intensive care or a ventilator. Our community surveillance testing is still not showing widespread outbreak. The research trial that you've heard about before that supports this effort originally planned to assess findings during the common flu season, and that flu season is winding down. We are using our clinical supplies for those who need care now. The data continue to reassure us that COVID-19 is not as intensely active or widespread in the communities we serve as it is in other parts of the country. 
The regional efforts at social distancing appear to be paying off, and we appreciate what everyone is doing to help flatten the curve. That flattening is an effort that allows us to optimize care, to learn more about the virus, and to bring us closer to therapeutics and vaccines, just like what my partner shared with you. Thank you, doctors. And now we'll take questions from the media, all of whom are joining us remotely online from around the world. To ask a question, you'll have to go to the participants icon at the bottom of the page and press the raise your hand button. That will put you in the queue. Again, go to the bottom of the page, press on the participants button, and then press the raise your hand button. If your question has been asked and you want to get out of the queue, you can press the lower your hand button. I will read your name and your line will be unmuted for you to, to ask your question. We'll try to call on as many different media outlets as we can in the time that we have allotted. First question comes from Paul Goff, Pittsburgh Business Times. Paul, go ahead. Thank you, Paul, and, and thank you, doctors, for taking the time. Can you talk more about how um, your previous SARS work uh, which helped in the vaccine development of this particular uh, vaccine and, and, and how uh, that was so critical, why that was so critical to kind of have that